can tell you we've got a stellar cast this evening uh, to discuss what is a, a very interesting subject, and that's the influence of the narrative in international criminal trials. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Professor Margaret de Guzman, Meg de Guzman, uh, Professor at Law at Temple Law School. Um, she is also the co-director of the Institute for International Law and Public Policy. Uh, she's speaking to us tonight from Philadelphia in the US. Um, she is a specialist in all aspects of international criminal law. And by that, I mean IHL, human rights law, transitional uh, justice. Um, she has written extensively and she particularly focuses upon questions concerning the international criminal court. And she was a contributor to our next speaker's uh, book, which was The Arcs of Global Justice, Essays in Honor of William A. Shabbos, um, a very distinguished body of work. And I'll now introduce Bill Shabbos, Professor Bill Shabbos, OC, Order of Canada. And I know he's very proud of that and also a member of Nine Bedford Row as a door tenant. Um, when I invited him to become a door tenant, he asked me, first of all, what was it? Um, and when I explained that it was uh, uh, something that Nelson, Nelson Mandela um, had in his honor uh, down in the inner temple, um, he said, well, if it's good enough for Nelson Mandela, it's certainly good enough for me. Um, Bill is uh, an, a, a very important influence upon international uh, criminal law because he's authored uh, many eminent textbooks, um, well known to students as well as practitioners. Um, he's also uh, been a contributor to UN projects, uh, the Commission of Inquiry into the Gaza War, where he had a, a role, but more importantly, uh, in relation to what we're dealing with tonight, and I know it's going to come up. Um, he was a member of the Sierra Leone uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where narrative was, was a particular focus. Um, after Bill Shabus, we have Dr. Mark Ellis, who is the Executive Director of the International Bar Association. Um, prior to joining the IBA, uh, he was a member of CELI, which was the Central European and Eurasian Law Initiative, um, which was a project run by the American Bar Association. Why I mention that is because in 1996, I got an invite to go to The Hague uh, to instruct the um, Dutch law team involving uh, uh, Professor Vladimirov, and now his honor Judge Ori, uh, in the art of cross-examination and case analysis uh, for international criminal trials, and in particular, the Tardich case, which was the first case to be heard at the ICTY. Uh, Mark Ellis was very much the organizer of that project and very much heavily involved in the initial establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal uh, for the former Yugoslavia. So Mark and I go back a very long way, too many years uh, to mention. And he has uh, also uh, written upon subjects of international uh, criminal law. And uh, he was heavily involved in the Iraqi uh, tribunal as well, which you remember took place. So having introduced uh, the background to my speakers, I, I'm now going to turn first of all to uh, Meg de Guzman, Margaret, uh, for you to give us some thoughts about our chosen subject for this evening's webinar. Meg, thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you for including me in this um, really important discussion. Um, the, the focus of my remarks will be on this concept of, of shocking the conscience and how the narrative around that 
idea has influenced the development of international criminal law and um, and sort of the the dangers that the narrative poses for international criminal law's ability to do justice, in particular with regard to fair trials and defendants' rights. So this is a, a question that I've been thinking about for a long time, um, and that is to say this idea that international crimes are the worst of the worst, are crimes that shock the conscience of humanity, is an idea that is very much pervasive in international criminal law, both in terms of the discourse among um, supporters of international criminal law, even critics of international criminal law, and in terms of the jurisprudence. So courts will frequently cite this idea in order to justify various kinds of conclusions, various decisions related to jurisdiction, related to admissibility, uh, related to defendants' rights, sentencing, and so on. And yet it's an idea that is very poorly understood and frankly, very little examined to date. So um, I recently published a book on it, uh, which is entitled Shocking the Conscience of Humanity, Gravity and the Legitimacy of International Criminal Law. And in the book, I start by examining the idea itself and noting that it was not inevitable that international criminal law come to be focused on this idea, right? That, that international, there was a kind of a turning point um, right around the time that the Rome Statute was adopted where international criminal law could have included what were then called treaty crimes, uh, crimes that involve more than one state that cross borders, crimes like drug trafficking, for example. There was heated debate in Rome about whether to include those kinds of crimes. And even again at the review conference in Kampala 10 years later, the issue was revisited. But each time it failed. And instead, um, what have come to be known as atrocity crimes are the central subjects of international criminal law. Why is this problematic? Well, Although it is true, of course, that many of the crimes that international courts deal with are very, very grave in whatever sense one might consider the concept, uh, it is not always the case. And it is not generally examined in any kind of detail when the idea is used to reach conclusions. So um, in terms of the, for example, um, war crimes. War crimes can be individual crimes by individual perpetrators unconnected to any kind of systematic commission of crimes. And they can be of relatively low impact on victims. Nonetheless, war crimes are lumped in with crimes against humanity and genocide as atrocity crimes and the sort of the crimes treated as a package lead to conclusions about things like defendants' rights. So I, I am only supposed to talk for a few minutes, so I'll just give a few examples. And I know that our discussion is going to focus on fair trials. Um, but what are some examples of ways that courts use this concept of gravity or of crimes shocking the conscience of humanity to um, limit defendants' rights or limit the defenses that are available. Some examples include um, many of the tribunals have had a relatively low burden of proof, at least I argue in the book, um, in terms of the kinds of evidence that is admitted and the way that courts reach conclusions based on the evidence. Anonymous witnesses are allowed, evidence that is illegally obtained, evidence that would not typically be admitted in many domestic systems is often admitted on the grounds that these are such horrible crimes um, that this kind of evidence, despite its potentially less reliable nature, um, 
is, is ought, it ought to and is admitted. Another example is that trials uh, take tremendously long um, and this violates a right to an expeditious trial, arguably. But uh, again, courts will justify the length of the trials based on this idea of these crimes being extremely grave and um, the need for sort of very, very lengthy and involved um, trials. So in addition, and I'll just close with this, there are many decisions that justify limiting defenses. Um, so limiting the availability of immunities, um, li limiting the applicability of amnesties, uh, taking a very narrow view of the principle of legality in deciding that certain crimes um, that haven't really existed in any concrete form can nonetheless be applied against particular defendants. Limiting duress, superior orders, statute of limitations. Um, and so my, my argument is not that these decisions are necessarily all wrong, um, but rather that we ought to interrogate this idea of crimes being particularly grave and be careful about how we apply it in order to avoid um, unfairness in international criminal law. So I will stop there and look forward to the discussion. Stephen, I think you're still on mute. Yeah, there we are. I should never press buttons, of course, you all know that. Um, <laughs> thank you, uh, Meg. I'm gonna turn now to Professor Shabas. Um, Meg's point being uh, quite clear there that the, um, and, and this does, is often the case, the, the bigger the allegation, the more likely people are to believe it, and, and the more difficult there are for uh, rights of an accused to be maintained and supported. Um, what, what's your perspective on the narrative within International Criminal Trials Bill in five minutes? Thank you, Stephen. Well, trials, international criminal trials, international criminal tribunals, whether we like it or not, are uh, often, maybe not always, linked to a message, a narrative, an agenda that has a political dimension to it. Whether we go back to 1919, the idea that Kaiser Wilhelm started the war and that the Germans committed all the atrocities to the narrative in the Second World War about Nazi atrocity and uh, about the aggressive war. We can see it today at the International Criminal Court. Later this week, we're going to have the judgment in the Ongwen case. That's part of a narrative about civil war in Uganda being the result of the evil Lord's Resistance Army. There have been no prosecutions against the government forces of Uganda uh, for anything, any atrocities that were committed. It's part of describing a conflict. We have an ongoing trial at the, at the International Criminal Court in the al Hassan case, which is the narrative about the uh, nasty Al-Qaeda affiliate, affiliate that took over Northern Mali and started to persecute the population. So there are a number of, there are narratives there that are associated with them. What's interesting to look at is how the courts deal with this. They don't always prove the narrative. So they come with a narrative about a conflict and they actually don't deliver the goods. And at the end of the day, we're not sure um, whether they got, got the narrative right. Sometimes the narrative is sort of imposed on the court afterwards. One of the ongoing experiments, the new ones in international justice, the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, began with a narrative about organ uh, trading, about Serb prisoners being murdered in Albania and having their organs taken off them. And I think a lot of people still think that's what the Kosovo Specialist Chambers are doing. That narrative has been dumped altogether. And now those, those chambers are focusing on something significantly different, although the targets are the same. The acts are quite different. You mentioned in your introduction that I had served on the Truth Commission for Sierra Leone, and there was a, a theory early in the work of that tribunal that came, I think it was uh, first announced by the uh, president of the appeals chamber, Jeffrey Robertson. And uh, Jeff 
said in, in a ruling that he made that he thought the relationship between the Truth Commission and the Special Court for Sierra, Sierra Leone would be that the Truth Commission would develop the overall narrative and explanation of the conflict, and then the, spe the, the Special Court prosecutions would deal with the individual cases within that framework. But that's not what happened. What happened was that the Truth Commission developed a narrative that was quite different from the narrative that was developed and emerged from the work of the Special Court. So the Truth Commission's report, which came out in 2004, told the story of a conflict in Sierra Leone that was the result of a corrupt elite that had ruled the country for 30 years and that had provoked civil war by desperate young men and women trying to fight to overthrow it. Ultimately, they were hijacked by people with perverse objectives, but that that was essentially what that conflict was about. And the Truth Commission report said, this business that's all about diamonds, not really. That, that's not what the Truth Commission found. And the Truth Commission said that the rebels were after the diamonds only because the government had them and was using it to finance their side of the war. What did the special court do? It pursued a narrative that focused on, initially on the diamonds, but more generally on the idea that there were external forces to Sierra Leone that had sort of imposed the war on the people. And, and of course, the main culprit then became the head of state in a neighboring country who'd never even set foot on the territory. And the idea was that he was going to be the supreme villain. I'm talking about Charles Taylor. Finally, they couldn't really prove it. All they could do was establish that he was an accomplice and it didn't really establish the narrative. But it's interesting that these two institutions that were supposed to have a very, um, uh, a, a kind of a synergy between them and a compatible view of the conflict ended up actually going in different directions. I think that's one of the interesting facets of the narrative as well. Yeah, thank you, Bill. I remember the organs issue coming up in the Milosevic case and being served during the trial with all this evidence concerning organs and then being carried north from Kosovo into Serbia, allegedly. And I couldn't make head nor tail of it, nor really understand what it was doing in the case. And it didn't seem to even have any evidence to back it up, but it, 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 it occupied a lot of court time. But it was interesting to hear your point that it was part of the promotion for the Kosovo uh, Special Tribunal. Thank you. Mark, the narrative and uh, yeah. your perspective from it, yeah. because yes, you were there right at the start with the Yugoslavia Tribunal, which very much took as it's sort of following on from, from the Nuremberg Tribunal, if, if we go back that far in time. Well, it's fascinating because listening to Meg and, and Bill uh, and talking about the narrative and, and who are the players in the narrative, uh, who has part of uh, not only responsibility, but the opportunity to, uh, to create that narrative. And, and two years ago, uh, three of us, Professor Linda Carter and Professor Charles Jallo and I started looking at this and published a book uh, in, 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 in an area where we, we focused on the important role that civil society is playing as part of this narrative, and particularly in the area of uh, amicus curiae briefs. And this was really fascinating in the sense of how these were being used to engage with the courts, uh, which were initially doing so in ways of just providing uh, information that was kind of beyond the interest of the, of the parties themselves. But start, something started shifting and it started mostly in the domestic uh, experience in the United States and Canada where these amicus curiae briefs started to take on a source of, or become a source of really kind of partisan advocacy. And this started moving into the courts uh, and, and all of the international courts uh, have under the procedures we found and uh, the procedures and evidence rules, the ability for uh, outsiders to play a role through these amicus, uh, amicus curiae briefs, uh, either in person or predominantly in, in writing. And it was controlled by the courts. The courts could even in, could invite 
uh, civil society through NGOs, uh, or NGOs could seek an opportunities to submit. And this started becoming very important. Uh, and it started expanding among, uh, with these courts uh, beyond individuals, but actually involving states uh, and organizations and individuals in seeking their views in how this narrative of a case is gonna be uh, defined. And you see it in the ICC, uh, not as much as the other cases we found, but in the ICC has been fairly uh, active on that. Uh, the BIMBA case with Amnesty International played a very important role in the amicus coming in on superior uh, responsibility. Uh, the Bagbo case, uh, that too, where you had individuals invited to talk about, submit their opinions on uh, what the, the concept of a tax uh, uh, meant even allowing uh, uh, the African Union uh, to submit a brief in, in, in their views. Stephen, you'll remember back in the Tottage case early on uh, where the ICTY opened up the opportunity to listen to outside uh, views, including in this case, the United States government was prepared to come in to talk about, of course, the jurisdictional issue, which was crucial uh, for the ICTY at the, at the initial stage, uh, and about 20 other individuals as well uh, allowed to, to come in. Uh, but it was the ICTR that I think in this sense of thinking about a, a narrative and the role that uh, outside uh, individuals, entities played, and that had to do with, with the issue of, of rape uh, as an international crime, and particularly rape in regards to explicitly to, to genocide. And the uh, Akayasu case was to me the most important example of the role of outside uh, uh, influences, outside views in trying, to, trying to, to, to influence the narrative. Because in this case, it was in fact, civil society through NGOs that pushed for the court to look at rape as part of the indictment that the prosecutor had never included. I think it helped that we had a women judge uh, on that court that helps us reaffirm the necessity of having balance uh, with uh, uh, Judge uh, Navi Pele on there. But the fact that 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 one NGO and probably about 40 other human rights organizations were involved with pushing the court, advocating to the court on a narrative that had not even been considered, I think was really crucial. Uh, we saw the same thing with the special court for Sierra Leone, probably the most uh, active court in accepting uh, outside uh, uh, views through amicus, uh, amicus curiae briefs. Uh, and the Charles Taylor case was a big, a, 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 a big example of where there were uh, submissions that came in that became quite important in the decisions of, of, the, uh, of the tribunal. And we even see it in Cambodia with the extraordinary chamber of the courts of Cambodia, particularly with the joint, uh, the, uh, uh, joint uh, uh, criminal enterprise concept that too was that too got that really merit through the court's interest in hearing uh, through um, uh, the briefs, uh, the views of outside uh, uh, NGOs, the outside experts as well. So uh, when we take a step back and again, look at this within the narrative, I think we really need to, to understand the important role that uh, uh, these briefs, the Ika Karai briefs have played and in the briefs, particularly from civil society. And I think that's positive because it has allowed civil society to engage in this narrative. And I think that has been uh, very positive for international justice uh, at large. Yeah, um, there's a, um, we're gonna go into discussion, but there's a, um, a question that's just pop, popped up on what you've said there, Mark. And I'll, I'll put it first of all to, to Bill and then, Margaret, if I may. Um, Mark, there, uh, of the view that, that, that um, 
providing narratives can be helpful for a court, but I'm bearing in mind what Margaret said at the start. Uh, but Bill, um, first of all, looking at it from a historic situation and your experience, has this development of narrative been helpful for the truth? I think Mark is looking at it from the perspective of a voice and allowing engagement by uh, other areas uh, that may be interested in a particular case, but, but where does it take, take the truth and, and, and justice? What's your experience? Well, I don't know if we can equate truth and justice anyway. <laughs> That's another question. But uh, one of the, um, sometimes the narratives, well, the question, and I think this has been raised of the question on the chat now, the, the, it may influence the fairness of the trial because there's a narrative that's so entrenched about who the villain is that it really has become extremely difficult for that person to benefit from the presumption of innocence in a trial. And we've seen this at the ICC where civil society is also extremely disappointed when somebody gets acquitted. Um, and they view that as a great setback for, and it's a setback for the narrative in a way, but it's not a setback for justice when someone's acquitted. It's a proof that justice is working. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have to confront about this. I think that sometimes the other thing, and I was alluding to this in my, referring to this in my remarks, is that there is a narrative that a prosecution doesn't really prove. And, uh, and yet, I don't know whether it goes away. I mean, people talk about the Nuremberg trial and I think most people think the Nuremberg trial is about the Holocaust. I and mean, there, are, there are some pages in that judgment that are about the Holocaust, but most of it is not. And that's not really the narrative. Robert Jackson's narrative was one of aggressive war. But today, most people wouldn't, would, would be surprised to learn that. Students of the subject obviously know better, but they would be, they would be surprised to learn that about the, about the Nuremberg trial. Um, Mark Ellis referred to the... Um, the issue of genocide and rape. And of course we had that as an important part of the narrative at the Yugoslavia tribunal as well. I don't think the ICTY really developed that. I don't think that does emerge from the, from, there were some convictions of rapes, of course, there were some, but not the way it was anticipated uh, back in the 1990s. So then the question arises, and this is uh, when the prosecution fails to develop the narrative and prove it, does it mean that the narrative was false to begin with? Or, or does it mean that the prosecution failed to do its job to bring out the narrative? And, and I think that that's a, that's a challenging question for us sometimes. Yeah, um, Margaret, turning to you now, because I, I remember when we first started Tardich, and I'm sure Mark will agree with this, and I, I, I know it's something that you've studied, we were all very concerned about a fair trial and uh, Amnesty contacted me, Human Rights Watch contacted me, everybody involved around the ICTY at the start wanted to make sure there were fair trials. They were very much thinking back to Nuremberg and the criticisms over Nuremberg being uh, the, the military trial be, being an unfair, fair trial, and uh, by modern, modern times. Um, but now, do you hear anything like that from the NGOs and human rights groups about fair trials? You don't, I, I have to say. Um, I remember when I started the Kenyatta case at the ICC, I complained about a press release from um, uh, one of the uh, very key uh, supporters of, of the court, that it was so one-sided. And uh, they wrote back to me saying, we will bear in mind your comments. They weren't going to change them, but it was a one-sided episode. Margaret, you were really, I think, um, from your opening statement, uh, looking at things very carefully in relation to justice. What, what, what would you say uh, about the influence of NGOs? So it's interesting. I think that we have to keep in mind that courts are inherently expressive institutions. 
So there are going to be narratives that emerge around the work of any court. And what Mark was saying about the, the positive aspects of having kind of outside um, civil society, that is to say, I, I took that to me in any way, global civil society having an input um, into the development of the narrative, particularly through amicus curiae briefs, I think raises for me the question uh, that I think, again, is very much underdeveloped in international criminal law about who the main audiences are for the expression that international criminal law engages in. And in particular, I think that the, the regime is still divided between um, some folks who wanna focus on global audiences, global civil society states, but looking at the ICC, for example, as an institution that is intended to speak to the world. And others who view international criminal law and particularly institutions like hybrid tribunals, but even the ICC as more aimed at the victims of the particular crimes that the institutions adjudicate. And I think that that tension between those audiences is at the heart of some of the real problems in international criminal law, including the sort of failure to really understand what kind of justice it ought to be delivering. And even to the point of thinking about defendants' rights and fair trials, if the main audience for a case is the um, community where the crimes were committed, then perhaps that community's understandings of justice and fair trials ought to be the one that is taken into account. I was actually working on the Tadich case in 97, um, and that institution was very much conceived of at, at the inception, as you say, as sort of a, a um, as, as taking up the legacy of Nuremberg and I think the focus was very much global. It wasn't on, you know, sh what are the norms in former Yugoslavia and how can we take those into account in ensuring justice and fair, fair trial standards. So I think that this question of narrative, we have to think about whose narrative, who ought to be influencing the narrative and think about that in terms of the purposes that these institutions are really intended to serve. And I think those questions are still really unanswered at a theoretical level. Yes, that, thank you. Mark, can I yep. just raise this um, with you? Because there's a question from Sarah Dill um, about fake news um, and mentioning uh, the recent election in America and the the, the stolen election and the fraudulent election. Well, we've had that in international criminal law. That was part of the backdrop to the Kenya case was the so-called uh, stolen election and uh, pleaded by one side, which had been taken up and copied from Ukraine and where it had come to the fore and, and caused the uh, deposing of um, um, a, a president that certain parties didn't like. Mark, is, is, it, is it dangerous having these days so much concentration upon a narrative, given our, uh, what we face with, with social media? Well, I think, I, I, I don't think so. I think, I think the narrative is extremely important. I think it's challenging as we've been discussing here, but a narrative that is uh, uh, that is objective, that's based on facts, evidence, uh, is exactly what I think is part of the responsibility of international justice, is to, is to express and define what that narrative is based on uh, truth. Um, and the, where, where we've had a real challenge is the disconnect between international justice that is being portrayed by tribunals and the perception of, inter of, so perception of justice in what, what Meg was talking about, the purpose, if the purpose is to have a better understanding in the, uh, in, 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 in the area of the conflict uh, so that the tribunal's work can help define a narrative that everyone can accept as true. That's, that is a disconnect. 
because we are not, we haven't seen that. We didn't see that with the ICTY in relations to the former Yugoslavia, particularly in Serbia. Uh, the views of, 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 of the Serbian population in regards to what was coming out of the CTY was completely different from what I or others might perceive as being objective truth. But there was a difference. The, the, it, the, the pendulum started swinging when they, if you all, if you remember the videos that came out, the filming that came out of the massacre in Srebrenica and elsewhere, that hard evidence started shifting uh, the narrative in the eyes of, of, of the of population in Serbia. So it, it's a real challenge on this. Uh, Stephen, I wanted to say one thing about the fair trial and it got back to the Tadic trial and, and it was a visit I made to Justice Goldstone before the Tadic trial was even starting. I was there, as you mentioned about uh, for the American Bar Association saying to Justice Goldstone, uh, we, the American Bar Association would like to assist you uh, in, in prosecuting this first case since, uh, since Nuremberg. And it was an hour long conversation. And in the end he said, Mark, I appreciate your visit here, but I want you to help the defense. And, and he said, the, I'll never forget this, the yardstick measurement of this case is not whether Mr. Tottage is found guilty, but whether he's perceived to have had a fair trial. And I'm worried that the defense does not have the resources. Could you help in that way? That I thought was remarkable. And that led to everything that followed, Stephen. So the, the idea that the prosecutor had his focus on ensuring that the trial itself would be fair was I think quite remarkable and indicative of who Justice Goldstone is. Absolutely, a, a remarkable man and uh, a very good uh, prosecutor as, as well and how he ran the uh, institution was exemplary. Um, <coughs> just looking at Bill, <coughs> at what Mark said, um, how far does the narrative take us away from evidence? That, that, that's uh, what I'd like your perspective upon and, and what examples there, there might be, because the narrative can, can uh, in fact cause the story itself to be the thing that is supported rather than the evidence. Well, we have, you know, crimes that are being prosecuted and that are being shoehorned into a, this narrative, this, this, this narrative of a conflict. And that's inevitably, and I think you've made the point, and I think Meg de Guzman made the point as well, that it may inevitably have consequences about how rigorous the evidence is being, the, the assessment of the, the evidence. There's also, of course, the willingness of courts and tribunals to to be, I don't know if maybe rely is too strong a word, but we have a lot of, uh, of, of supplementary materials, reports from uh, NGO documents and, and, and uh, commissions of inquiry from the United Nations that, that influence as well the evidence and how it's perceived. Of course, we have to hope that we have, we need judges who are fair and, uh, and we generally have that. And we need defense lawyers who are competent and are able to to pick this all apart as well and to hold them to the, to the standard. As I say, I think, you know, you mentioned Richard Goldstone. I was reading something he published very recently um, talking about the, um, the acquittals at the International Criminal Court and repeating what he told Mark years and years ago, almost a quarter of a century ago, that there's nothing wrong with acquittals. Um, you know, there's but, but, but that narrative, I mean, it also relates to something we are, we're, we're, when we go to the case law of a body like the European Court of Human Rights, we find the sensitivity to how, not a narrative exactly, if they're not using that term, but how the political discussion and, and uh, statements about criminal activity can uh, encroach upon the, the presumption of innocence and thereby also uh, influ influence the trial. But it's very difficult it's very difficult to identify that and to, to, to extract those, those factors. And it takes judges, I think, with the courage to say that narrative, set it aside. But then they're being, they're being told that this is about doing collective justice in a way, that what they're, 
what the role of the tribunal is, is to do justice for an amorphous body of victims. And that means that the narrative is going to be influential in directing how they, 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 how they perceive the role of the trial, which is, is more than simply determining the guilt or innocence of a specific individual in a precisely defined case. Yeah, I was once asked a question, uh, you must read a lot before each case you, you, you take, you must read all the reports about it and all the history books. And I surprised the journalist by saying, no, I don't read any of them, to be frank, I just look at the evidence because I know people who read those reports and they lose sight of the evidence and they think that the truth is in the reports or some book. Um, Meg, I'd like your perspective uh, upon this because the narrative can cause confirmation bias, couldn't it? Isn't that a danger? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a real danger. And I think, you know, I'm sure that that happens in courts around the world, you know, international courts and otherwise. But I, I also think that, um, you know, as I said before, narratives developing is inevitable. And so it, to me, it's not a question of, you know, is it is it good or bad that there's narrative? It's a question of, who ought to be influencing the narrative and how? And are they doing it in a way that is cognizant of the ultimate aims of international criminal justice? So um, Bill raised the issue of, you know, the, the idea that the aim is uh, some kind of justice for the victims. And I think that's a very powerful aspect of the narrative that can sometimes lead to shortcuts and, and other um, approaches to the law that, that run the risk of undermining defendants' rights. And so then it's important that other players in the system stand up for and sort of steer the narrative in a way that, you know, that focuses on defendants' rights to sort of, to sort of counter, um, counter that. So somebody in the chat was also asking an interesting question about the ICC. Is it one narrative or is it multiple narratives that evolve at the ICC? And I think, and, and in particular, whether the different organs of the court um, build different narratives. And, and I think they do, right? I think that um, there's a narrative that is built by defense counsel and by you know the the victims councils and then also by the prosecution um, and those those narratives are in conversation with one another and that's a good thing the danger comes when there's just a really dominant narrative sometimes from the outside um, that doesn't leave space for that contestation of narratives and that's when I think it, it becomes dangerous in terms of defendants' rights. But if we have, you know, multiple organs of an institution as well as, you know, outside players, civil society, you know, victims' rights advocates and so on, all contributing to contested narratives, narratives that are in conversation with one another, then that is probably the best we can do to try and ensure fair trials. Yes, we, we haven't talked about the, the historical importance of these trials, particularly. Mark, when we first went to, to The Hague, um, I always remember that there was a big discussion about the filming of the trials, as well as the archiving of the trials, and they were to create a record in the same way that uh, Nuremberg had a record and, and, and an archive. Is that kind of historical uh, uh, quotient something that puts too much pressure upon the business of the court, which is to do justice? Is, does, does that seeking to have this place in history? I, I think many, many would argue that it does, and they wouldn't see that the court's primary or even a within the top five of the responsibilities the court has or focus should be on that type of historical uh, lessons or, or the history being 
being created. I happen to be probably in the minority. I think that is part of what the court should be doing. I recognize it's a bit of a challenge, but to me, this gets back to the narrative. If, if you're able to create a narrative based uh, on the evidence, based on the facts, based on the advocacy that comes from two parties that's uh, then determined by the court, that should stand. That won't be the entire narrative, but it's an important narrative uh, to, to have. Will it shift the uh, views of it, 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 those in the conflict uh, arena? Uh, Jennifer puts in the chat about that, what happens if the ICTY's narrative is completely different and the domestic narrative never gets there, uh, never gets to that, that type of, 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 of recognition. And I think that, that, is, that that's part of the challenge. But the fact is in the early stages of international criminal law with the tribunals, the idea of outreach was never really a, a paramount issue. Certainly it was not with the ICTY, but I'll, I'll say that right now with any tribunal that has come on, including the ICC, outreach is an, is an important part, not only for the, for the general public, but specifically for those that are in in the arena where the conflict occurred. So uh, I, I, I think that's part of it and determining the history is also a, a part of the responsibility. Bill, you, um, you're uh, the, the biggest historian I know in the subject that we're, we're talking about. You devour the history books and old records and, and go back to original sources. Um, do you think too much history, though, is, is good for justice? Mark's come in with a view there that, that he thinks it's important because it's part of the outreach and, and to explain uh, to people. But, but does this put a pressure on, on justice? Well, of course, history is constantly being reassessed and rewritten. So the, the, what we're talking about when we talk about a narrative are people in effect manufacturing a, a, a version of history that may or may not uh, be sustainable. And, and uh, we know that there are interpretations and ideas about history that evolve and change. I mentioned that going back to the, the First World War where the assumption was that Kaiser Wilhelm had started the war, but finally when they looked more closely at it, it wasn't quite so obvious about it. You know, I think that maybe one of the things we haven't really turned our attention to too much in this discussion is that in, in cases, and we could talk about the cases that are before the ICC at the present, you have cases where there are two different narratives. So we have uh, this ongoing situation in, in uh, Palestine, which is before the, the, uh, now before the pretrial chamber, and we're waiting for a ruling on this territorial issue. And as you know, there have been 50 or 60 amici curiae that are not entirely on the, on the same wavelength. Am I understating the situation there? Different <laughs> narratives indeed. And somebody at some point is gonna to have to take a decision if this goes forward, whether the prosecution will be about firing rockets from Gaza into Israel, or whether it will be about building settlements in the West Bank. That's a narrative about a conflict. We have we have, if you go on the website of the court, you'll see the two in the preliminary examinations, Venezuela one and Venezuela two. They're both about the same reality, which is the suffering of the people of Venezuela. One of them says it's the responsibility of the government in power in Venezuela. The other says it's a result of the sanctions imposed by the United States and its allies. Those are very different narratives about the conflict and there are different publics who support them as well. And uh, it's going to be, I mean, I guess we'll know, I, I think the, the king is going to be crowned next Monday, we think, of the ICC, the new prosecutor. But somebody has to adjudicate those, those narratives, those, that, that, that way of looking at the conflict, at yeah. looking at the situation. And yeah. it, it's going to, and there's no correct answer because we're divided on how we see this. We're not on the same wavelength. We're divided about how we view the situation in the Middle East, how we view the situation in Venezuela and elsewhere. And we're we could look at Afghanistan as well. And we see this in, even in the preliminary, even in the reports of the prosecutor. Is Afghanistan mainly about torture by US agents or is it about atrocities 
by the Taliban. That's narrative. Yeah. Um, Meg, uh, do you think the international courts and tribunals have succeeded at all in, in trying to produce an accurate historical record as they uh, are aware, the judges are aware, the court is aware that there are competing views as to what started a conflict, how a conflict started, or at least there emerged competing views. Sometimes I've noticed in, in some cases, it's all been one way until the direction, the evidence changes it. Do you, do you think they've been successful in their, in their bid to um, define history? Or the historical? No, I, I think, yeah, I, I think they have played a part. I don't know how one would measure success in, in, in order to answer that question. Um, I think some have been more cognizant of, of that part of their role than others. So the, the special court for Sierra Leone, I think rightly gets some credit for um, the way in which the prosecutorial selection decisions um, showed the role of various parties in the conflict and that that was probably an important thing for that institution to do um, in order to contribute to the historical record. Um, you know, the, the ICTR gets criticized for only having prosecuted, you know, one side when the government was also engaging in atrocities. And I, I think that whether that was the right thing to do or not is actually a diff more difficult question than it is sometimes made out to be because the, the court was focusing on what it saw as the, the main narrative, right? The genocide was the main narrative. Um, and yet by not prosecuting um, those in power, the court also lost some credibility with, with many audiences. So I think, again, it, it gets back, for me, it gets back to the question of what are the goals of the institution and when they come into conflict. So, so one of the goals might be to contribute to the historical narrative, but that goal might come into conflict with a goal of, for example, um, Ken Gallant in the chat has raised the issue of deterrence. Um, and, and maybe a, an institution is also thinking about what are the most important crimes to deter right now? And so, for example, when um, the Special Court for Sierra Leone and now the ICC have focused on child soldiers, is that because it's such an important part of the historical narrative? Maybe. Um, is it because those are the worst, you know, recruiting and using child soldiers are the worst crimes happening in those conflicts? arguable, but is it very, very important to be deterring the use of child soldiers, not just in those conflicts, but around the world? Absolutely. And is that a very legitimate reason to make those selection decisions? Um, I think so, uh, even though it sort of maybe paints a very partial picture of the conflict. Um, there are just there are other goals that have to that have to be balanced. So I think that one of the other things that I just wanted to point out here is the importance, and, and I think Bill's point about um, Gaza and the ICC raises this as well. The the important role that prosecutorial selection decisions play in painting the narrative, right? What the prosecutor selects is what then is front and center, and if other players want to have a role in shaping the narrative, they have to really work either with or against that narrative. It sort of becomes dominant. Yeah, uh, there's a question we've got here from Sarah Kay, no relation uh, for you, um, Meg, um, which uh, I'll just put to you and I'll read it out. Is the legal narrative the only one that should be elevated or can we accept to have a different, if not outright contesting one due to the fact that admissible evidence can't possibly be the whole picture, especially in conflict. Yeah, thank you for that, Sarah. I, I very much agree that the legal narrative can't be the only one and that it, 
it's important for these institutions to be humble and to be forthright about what they can accomplish. Um, and, and I think to a significant degree that, you know, the ICC has been pretty good at this in their um, public relations efforts to say, look, you know, we are pursuing a particular defendant for particular crimes based on very specific evidence. And this is not going to represent everything that happened in the conflict. Um, you know, here are the reasons why we are choosing to pursue this particular person for this particular crime. But everybody should keep in mind that there's a lot more happening here than a court can capture in a handful of cases, which is all we have the resources to pursue. Um, so I think it's very important to have other and actually, I'm right now. I'm I'm hosting somebody next week who's talking about the overcriminalization in this area. I think that's a, something to keep in mind too. You know, it may be that we should pay more attention to truth commissions again, to other modalities, to traditional justice mechanisms, so that there are other bodies also seeking to tell the to tell the stories, to contribute to the narratives. Yeah, uh, Bill, perhaps I can address this follow-up question from Sarah Kayes. Um, <coughs> the role of legacy projects uh, in regards to cementing challenging narratives in international uh, criminal justice. Uh, uh, legacy projects, Bill, what, what do you think about them? Well, legacy projects are in a way as good as the, as good as the narrative that emerges from the from the tribunal, so that to the extent there are um, uh, issues that are resolved, the legacy project is going to ensure that that's um, that, that that's respected. You know, I was reminded of, a, of something that Michael Ignatiev said many years ago. I think speaking about truth commissions, but I think it's just as apropos with regard to uh, international criminal tribunals. He said they may not be able to get to the whole truth, but they can put some of the lies out of the commission. And that's very important when we live in a world also where, where we talk about denial about people. And we know that we have encountered this for decades now with denial about the genocide of the, the Nazi genocide committed during the Second World War and how important that is and how that continues to, we continue to have to fight that. Even in recent weeks, the reports of these uh, uh, fanatics demonstrating for Trump in Washington in early um, uh, in early January are deniers. There's lots of documents about documentary support about that. So this is where this is where the Nuremberg judgment and the Eichmann judgment and some of the others are so important in saying, listen, all that evidence, you know. And this is this is the other part that the the tribunals do is they create a, a, a substrate of evidence that's also going to remain and that historians may be uh, consulting and reviewing and analyzing for for eternity in a way. So, you know, I think if we have less, if we're more modest in our ambitions about the, about tribunals and we say, can they put some lies out of commission? People who deny uh, the atrocities, the genocide committed at Srebrenica in 1995, that's done. We have the judgments. We have the evidence. That's clear. Nobody can challenge that. And I could give many other examples, the Rwandan genocide, things that where there are questions about it. Meg says, and I agree with Meg about this, I think that we can oversimplify how the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda should have dealt with the, the crimes perpetrated by those on the other side, the so-called RPF crimes. But one thing is for sure that the atrocities committed against the Tutsi minority are, are beyond dispute now. And, and we can see that, we can even see that in the willingness of legislators in many European countries, for example, to um, define uh, crimes of denial and hate propaganda with regard to the Nuremberg judgment as a source, as an authority, and perhaps in the future, if denial of, of Srebrenica or denial of, uh, of uh, the Rwandan uh, genocide or other atrocities becomes an issue in the future, those judgments are going to be there and the evidence that they heard is going to be is going to be decisive and it will be eternal. Yes, and Mark, do you think truth and reconciliation uh, commissions 
uh, get to the evidence in the same way as a court does? Mm, I, I would say no. I would say in the truth and reconciliation process, you're getting much more towards a shared narrative. And I think that has great merit uh, to it. Um, uh, so I, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I lean in that direction for that reason. But I, I want to reiterate that, and I think Bill's just made the crucial point here uh, for me, and that is whether or not Again, there's a narrative that comes out of uh, judgments from courts. Whether we like it or not, there is. There has to be. If, if we're not accepting a, the, the fact that a judgment coming out of the court is, is not part of the narrative, whether or not it's accepted or not, then I, for me, we've got a bit of an issue. It is a narrative. It, it's a, it will be part of the historical documentation that occurs, even if the court is not primarily focused on that. I think that's important. I think that's very crucial. Uh, it may not suggest a shift quickly enough, particularly for those that were part of the conflict. They will still debate uh, the nuances. They may even debate the whole issue. They may accept the denial part of this. I don't know. Uh, but I think it goes a long way uh, to ensure that there is an historical record and it's based on truth, it's based on evidence, and eventually that cannot be denied. And uh, th that, that, that I think is absolutely essential. Taking up a, a question or a point from Eva Vukusic here, uh, Bill, um, you speak a lot to international judges and um, uh, you're able to discuss their jobs and their work with them. Do, do you think they are comfortable making findings about history when they have to in a judgment in a way, when they, they have to refer to the context in a particular way? Do you think they find that easy? I think it probably depends on the individual judge, Stephen. I think judges do from time to time express their own um, discomfort, as you say, about doing this just as prosecutors and defense counsel do as well on both sides. They are constantly, if this was a conference of prosecutors or if it was a seminar of defense counsel, I think they'd all be saying, don't make us do this. This isn't our job. We have a very, but, but as, as Mark Ellis has just said, it's an inescapable that is, that goes with the, with the territory. I think that there are, are lawyers, again, defense counsel and prosecutors who also understand that they are part of a historical process and they, they, they enjoy isn't the right word, but they thrive in that environment. And I think there are judges as well. I think there must be judges who are very, very conscious of their, um, the fact that, that they are making, that their decisions are um, historically significant. Whether they want to admit that or not, maybe they, some of them feel that it's, that, you know, too egotistical to admit that you have that ambition, but it's like anybody participating in a historic process, just like you and me and others, we might do something entirely uh, minimal in terms of our personal involvement, like participate in an event, go to a, 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 a demonstration or a parade and we'll tell our grandchildren that we were there and we think that we contributed to history. I'm sure judges do that too. Um, I have no doubt that Robert Jackson and Jeffrey Lawrence and the, you know, the rock stars of the Nuremberg trial, they were aware that they were part of history and that they were making history as well as, as identifying it. I, I think Sir Norman Burkitt certainly did. And he was only of course, the deputy right. British judge, but he claimed writing the entire judgment and uh, many felt that he thought he was on the bench during the trial, but of course he wasn't. Um, and um, uh, luckily he's still not sitting today as he'd probably uh, take me to task. Um, Meg, there's a very good point from Amber Pierce and, and you were there at the time. I remember in the Tardich trial, witness number five was Professor Gow from uh, King's College, London. There was a few early witnesses who didn't give evidence about very much other than um, crimes that were happening and no one could really see what, where the, that evidence was, was, was taking us. 
Um, but Professor Gao came in and, as I recollect, it gave evidence for, for over a week. Um, that was enormously controversial and um, the um, criticisms from various parties and factions, even from Serbs or, or Bosnians or uh, uh, Croats, um, all parties in relation to what he said as, as a historian, as an expert, um, trying to define for the judges what it was about and what the history was. Was, was that a good thing to have done, do you think, in looking back at that trial? So it's a very interesting question and not one that I have considered with respect to that trial in particular. Um, in general, I would say that, it, again, it gets back to the particular audience that the institution is seeking to reach and how the trial is, is framed and how the, the narrative that the court wishes to contribute to is framed is going to influence the extent to which they want to bring in and the particular experts that are appropriate to bring in. Um, and so I think it, it is important to be very careful particularly for an institution that is torn between seeking to contribute to a global narrative and to particular goals of the society most affected by the crimes. In that kind of a situation, the institution has to be very careful to um, bring in experts that are going to be received positively and productively by those audiences that are important to the to the yeah. to the institution's goals. And again, there there may be a tension there. There may be conflict where the the expert and this may be what was what you're um, sort of referencing in regard to what happened at the ICTY, that the expert is very much able to speak to the narrative that a global civil society um, sees emerging from the institution, but much less able to do so with regard to the local communities most affected by the crimes. And that, that's a real tension and a real question of most appropriate goals that, that institutions need to be, I think, more attentive to than they have thus far. Um, and, and sort of thinking about bringing in experts in terms of what are the goals and how will this expert seek to contribute to those to those goals and particularly when they're in tension. I can't resist saying that I see, I saw at some point anyway that Ted Marone was on the call and you know I think would, is somebody who has contributed tremendously to narratives and uh, you know th that there are, there are many people who have contributed in very, very fundamental ways, right? Beyond going to protests. Um, I, I think we have to recognize those roles. Um, anyway, that's, that's not directly responsive to your question, but I was just, I was just happy to see him there. Um, I must confess to, to letting um, Professor Gao go in the sense I didn't object. And I think that was because we had our own expert witness and I might have been prevailed upon by other members in the team not to take that point but there was a Scandinavian judge who followed him um, called Hans-Sophie Gray. She may have been a, a Swedish judge. Um, anyway, uh, she had been um, specially commissioned by the UN to go into uh, Bosnia and the Priador area in particular, which was the, uh, the setting of the uh, Tardic case. And I objected to her evidence. As I said, it was full of hearsay. She'd not been there at the time. She's just reporting what everyone else has told her. And she, she doesn't know whether it, it's true. Um, and uh, made my objection and uh, lasted five minutes with Judge McDonald, uh, kicked out uh, as yet another um, obstructive um, objection from, from the defense. 
Um, but that's all right. Um, we grew to like each other. But uh, to me, um, it, it was, what is this about? I, we're meant to be trying a man who was in a place at a time. And yet we're, we're, we're talking about this obviously very distinguished judge telling what everybody else told her and putting it into a UN report. And I felt that was prejudicial. I felt that was building up the wall of sound around the court. And um, there were a lot of people I know who wrote afterwards saying that that was the right, right thing to do. What do you could think? I, could I say something on that? Yeah, I, I, I want to say I, I agree. I, uh, the idea that you were going to come in and create a shared historical narrative about the former Yugoslavia is a big ask. Uh, I lived in the region before the war for three years. The, I, the sense that you would have uh, a, a agreed upon history of a hundred different issues is, is a bit naive. You won't have it. Uh, so I would get back to Meg's point. If that had an impact, it did, a, did it have any effect on the results of the trial that, that attempt to set out uh, uh, what he would have thought was an objective history, where in fact, I don't think it's possible, that would be a problem. However, although there wouldn't be a shared narrative on the history of, of the conflict, there could be in time a shared acceptance of the evidence and of what occurred in the wars in the former Yugoslavia based on the findings of the court. That to me is the narrative that I think is important to carry on. And that could be the new shared understanding in the region because of the, of the results, uh, because of the, the work of the court. Yeah, Bill, what, what about you in your, as a, an observer of these trials over the 25 years, the, these reports that come about like Hans Sophie Grebs, which I objected to, um, I felt it unbalanced the, 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 the case and um, it, wasn't, it wasn't based on the witnesses direct evidence. What, what, did you, what do you think about that? Well, we have many examples of the reports by UN mechanisms of various kinds and, uh, the, um, and, and also from NGO reports. I, I'm reminded when you speak about the historians of the, of the former Yugoslavia, about the, the other side, Rwanda, the other tribunal. I went first to Rwanda in 1993, at more than a year before the genocide as part of a fact-finding, an NGO fact-finding mission. And my colleague there was Alison Deforge, who you may have come across. You did the Musema case at the, yeah. Yeah. I expect she was a, an expert witness. She was a historian at the university in Buffalo and she had, she had her own vision of Rwanda. And uh, as a, called as a historian, she really just had opinions about the whole, the current situation in Rwanda and no doubt I think it had a great influence on the judges there and then the development of the, of the narrative. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's a false narrative. I, I think she contributed greatly, but probably it was a mix of evidence. You know, when we talk about evidence at a, at a court of law, um, you know, we're, we're all very attuned to the danger of convicting people who have not, who didn't commit the crime, who are innocent or where there's not enough evidence. And, Meg said this at the very beginning, that when we start to get these more informal mechanisms in there, uh, who have another role, they have a different role. When I did this, this mission in Rwanda, and I've done other fact-finding missions, where we were always saying, let's save the evidence for prosecution. You know, we could, we'll keep the evidence, it can be used in a prosecution. Of course, it never is. And uh, there was the famous commission, the, the Bassioni Commission, about the former Yugoslavia, and it really had... I think there was this idea that all that evidence would then just be given to the ICT, why? And they would convict people on the basis of it, but that didn't work. And now we're in this new generation of experiments about this, these sort of, where we have the, the Human Rights uh, Council setting up a, basically an investigative commission gathering evidence to prosecute uh, international crimes. And um, it's a different role normally, 
what we want from the Human Rights Council and from, from special rapporteurs and bodies like that, they're there to sound the alarm. They're there to alert public opinion to a, a, at a political level. And uh, once we blend them with the idea that they're also collecting evidence to be used in a court, we get into very dangerous ground because, because it's, they're, they're fulfilling a different purpose. Uh, they're applying different standards of evidence. They're relying on hearsay evidence because they're there to get people to get people to move on an issue, not to throw an individual human being to deprive them of their liberty and convict them of a of a serious crime. That's where that material is is I think particularly dangerous. I think asking that the background narrative is going to be established using other types of sources of evidence, including expert evidence, which ultimately is opinion evidence. And yeah. as you know, as a courtroom lawyer, if you can get an expert to say one thing, you could probably find an expert to say the opposite. You know, yeah. 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 Well, we, we, we did, we, 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 we found another expert to say the opposite to Professor Gow, although I don't think he features much in the credits of the judgment of the, uh, of the Tardich case at the ICTY. Um, Meg, I don't think the, the international courts and tribunals now are relying on NGO reports. Um, they were there in the early days, but um, they, the judges now are much more evidence-based, aren't they? They, they? In fact, they, they, I don't think they're, they're, they're even attempted to be put into evidence now. It used to be when we first started, there'd be a whole raft of reports dumped on the judge's desk and you stand up and object and the judges will say, well, we'll pay what regard we, we will, we, 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 we should to the meaning, we're not gonna read that, all those reports. Is, is that, am I right about that? I think that's right. I think that the whole um, regime has, has professionalized in various ways and that's probably an example of that. Um, I think judges, you know, Nancy Combs wrote a very good critical book about evidence, um, unreliable evidence coming in, particularly before the um, ICTY and ICTR, and maybe I think there was one other one in there. And I think that, um, you know, criticisms of some of the early work have led to more rigorous evidentiary standards being adopted. I also think it's important to keep in mind the difference between civil and common law systems in this regard and that you know, civil law systems tend to let in a great deal more evidence because they don't have juries. And these tribunals are seeking for the most part to blend these systems without really having adopted a philosophical position around how the, the blend is to be done. And so when evidence comes in that in a, a common law system might be considered unreliable and prejudicial and so on, um, you know, the standard would be significantly looser in a system where professional judges are, are, are believed to be able to, you know, discern um, what parts of the evidence they ought to take into account in making their determination and what parts to sort of leave aside in ways that juries should not. So I think that's part of what's going on here as well. Well, um, I could talk all night with the three of you and um, I, I don't uh, know whether everyone would remain listening, but um, I, I found this um, a very good evening um, we have to wind up now, as so we've been going an hour and, and 20 minutes. And um, it was a great pleasure for me to meet the three of you again, virtually. Um, one day we will meet again and, and be able to have that cup of coffee at a conference and, and, and a chat. Um, one of the reasons why I chose this title, and I mentioned it to Bill earlier today, was in 2011, we had this discussion about the narrative when we were in Salzburg and, and we were both appearing for um, dear old Otto Triptra's um, Salzburg Law School. And we were there at the same time and had a chat about the influence of the narrative. And um, I, I thought it would be a good one to kick off our, our series with. And um, 
uh, I must draw a line on it now as we've got staff to go home and that kind of thing. Well, no, they are at home. Um, but Mark, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Great talking to you. Thank you. Meg, thank you very much in Philadelphia there. Great thank talking you, to you. And Bill, great to see you again. And um, I'd like to present the thanks of Nine Bed Row for you joining me this evening. And I hope our listeners um, enjoyed it as, as much as I have done.